Today we have a crazy revenge story of flooding a best friend's apartment. We'll get into that in a bit, but first, best friend steals my boyfriend, so I spread a rumor about her. I, 24-year-old female, never knew that my best friend Alicia, 26-year-old female, would be the one thing that would cause the end of my relationship. I mean, I've thought a lot of scenarios where it all ended, but it was never because of her. I couldn't even picture it. Alicia had always been in my corner. She supported me when I was going through hard times. The fact that she morphed from being the most supportive person I've ever had in my corner to a boyfriend-stealing witch is beyond me. But I guess I should have known that in the end, when it came down to me and her, she'd always choose herself. The day our friendship took a turn was a Friday. We were done with work and I was planning to go home to continue the series I was watching, but some of our co-workers announced that they were going to a bar downtown to celebrate another co-worker's engagement. I wasn't very close to my co-workers, but Alicia was. We worked in the same department, and while I was the quiet and antisocial one, she was the outgoing friend, so she made sure to convince me to follow them to the bar. I didn't even know why she wanted me there because I didn't drink, but I agreed to go anyway. We got to the bar and everyone ordered a round of beer. Everyone except me. I took a glass of club soda instead. They all talked and laughed amongst themselves, but I just sat there. I was feeling really awkward among them. I don't know who made the rule that coworkers have to be friends because I don't buy it. We were just random strangers who happened to work in the same company. I'd worked in the company longer than Alicia, but she still had more friends than I did, and honestly, I was fine with that. After an hour of being in the bar, my social battery died and all I wanted was to go back home, or at least hide out somewhere there weren't a lot of people. I excused myself from my coworkers and went to the bathroom. I didn't come out for almost 30 minutes. There, I devised a plan with one of my neighbors to call me in exactly 10 minutes and say there was an emergency at home. I know it was a bit drastic, but I couldn't think of any other reason that they'd accept as to why I wanted to go home. So, with my plan formulated, I walked out of the bathroom, only to bump into a guy standing by the jukebox. I looked up to apologize, and I literally froze. He was handsome, dark eyes, smooth face, nice jawline, the works. His smile was also very disarming. There was some kind of innocence to them that made me feel safe in his presence. He apologized for not looking where he was going and introduced himself as Jake, 31-year-old male, and I told him my name. He offered to buy me a drink, so we walked over to the bar, and I got another club soda. We talked for a moment, and when my neighbor called me as scheduled, I hung up and texted her to call me in another 30 minutes. I spent the time with Jake, and when the 30 minutes was up, I told him I had to go. He asked for my number, which I promptly gave him, before I returned to my friend's table and told him that I had to leave. Jake and I got really close over the phone. We called and texted every day when I got back from work. It was a really fun time. Eventually, he asked me out on a date, and I said yes. We went out the next Saturday, and then the next, and the next, and eventually, he asked me to be his girlfriend on Valentine's Day. And of course, I said yes. Alicia noticed that I was more cheerful at work, and she asked what was going on. I didn't like to talk about relationship stuff at work, but I told her that Jake finally asked me out. Before then, she already knew who Jake was because I've mentioned him a billion times. She was indifferent about the whole thing because she was never one for relationships. She had a long string of men she used only for sex, but she never tried to be in a relationship with any guy. She once described love as a poison that should be avoided at all costs. Anyway, I was talking about how sweet and romantic Jake is, and she decided that she wanted to meet him. I invited her over to my place and introduced her to Jake as my best friend. I could tell that she was really taken with him because she was giving him all these compliments. Alicia has never been the one to hide how she feels. She's very blunt like that, and it's one of the reasons why I love her so much. They got talking, and I was really glad that my boyfriend and best friend were getting along. I had no idea that I'd come to regret that very day so much. By the end of our little hangout, Alicia was the first to leave. After that day, she started to ask me if she could hang out with us more often. It started with little things like coming over to watch a movie with us, or having dinner at my place, to third wheeling in arcades and bars. She didn't mind, and it was a bit weird. Alicia had never been that needy. As extroverted as she was, she loved her independence and always set her boundaries. But after meeting Jake, it just felt like she wanted to hang out with us every time. I should have seen this as a problem, but for some reason, I didn't. At least, not at first. 
but after a while, when it felt like she was the third partner in our relationship, I had to say something. I carefully told her that we wanted to hang out by ourselves sometimes, and she immediately got the message. She apologized for intruding and took a step back. But that was not the end. A few weeks after I talked to Alicia, I noticed that Jake was becoming more and more glued to his phone. He never liked Instagram or TikTok, but whenever we were together, he was watching it for the whole day, giggling like a child. I had been trying to put him onto TikTok for some time, but he'd never been interested. It was just a bit surprising that he was watching them, and I wonder what changed. One day, his phone was on the kitchen counter as we had dinner and he was by the sink, clearing up the used dishes. A notification came on his phone and I picked it up and looked at it. To my surprise, it was a WhatsApp message from Alicia. I didn't even know that he had Alicia's number, talk less of the fact that they were texting. I asked him about it immediately, and she said she took his number some time ago because I wasn't comfortable with her coming around anymore. That's what she told him. I explained to him that I just felt like we needed time to ourselves without her being around all the time. I didn't tell her not to hang out with us anymore. He also explained that she collected his number because she wanted to send him links to some TikTok videos she wanted him to see. This was where I started to suspect that something was going on, but I didn't want to make a big deal out of it. We were still cool at work, but she never asked to come over and hang out again, and even when I invited her, there was always an excuse. After some time, I noticed that Jake started to grow distant. Even when he was in my place, he rarely spoke to me. He was always on his phone or fixated on the TV. Whenever I tried to talk about this, He'd always bring up some lame excuse like he was tired or stressed from work and needed some rest or that I shouldn't compare the beginning stages of the relationship to the later stages because things were going to calm down eventually. But that wasn't even the worst part. Eventually, he just stopped coming over to my place to see me. Whenever I asked why, he'd say he was busy with work. Even when I offered to come over, he'd refuse and say things like he was tired and had to get some sleep. I also noticed that Alicia was growing distant at the same time. Something was definitely up, so I decided to confront him. One Friday night, I asked Alicia if she wanted to do something together. She declined, and I casually shrugged it off. Then I called Jake and asked him if he wanted to do something. He also said no, and I said okay. An hour after I got home, I decided to find out once and for all if my fears were valid. So I went over to Jake's house. I stormed in, and to my surprise... I saw him in the living room, all cuddled up with Alicia. The mix of shock, pain, and despair I felt that day was unmatched. Before I could even say anything, Jake yelled at me for coming to his place unannounced. He collected his spare key from me and broke up with me on the spot. I was dumbfounded. I just caught him cheating on me with my best friend. Wasn't I the one that was supposed to get angry? How come he was the one getting mad? I'd never felt more used in my life. How could my best friend do that to me? Besides, I'd known her for some time, and I knew that she didn't like relationships. So what was she doing with Jake? I didn't care. Alicia had stolen my boyfriend and humiliated me. She even had the guts to come to work the next day and ask me to move past it. I wasn't planning on doing anything before, but when she said this in the most condescending tone she had ever spoken to me, I decided to take my revenge. I told my neighbor Liv what happened. She's the same neighbor that I asked to call me that day at the bar. I explained everything to her, and she was just as outraged as I was, especially because she had met Alicia and Jake and she thought they were good people. We sat in her apartment and cooked up a plan. I planned to humiliate Alicia, just as she did to me. Liv asked me that there must be something in my past chats with Alicia that I could use against her, but that was when I remembered that Alicia permanently had disappearing messages turned on. It was disappointing for a minute till I realized the massive opportunity in front of me. I could make up a series of texts between me and Liv and make it seem like I was texting Alicia. I could put up some really embarrassing texts and send them to everyone at work. All I needed was Alicia's current profile picture. Thankfully, she had never changed her profile picture. She had the same one on for over a year, and I had the picture on my phone. We set up fake WhatsApp on Liv's phone with Alicia's picture and began texting each other. We talked about Alicia getting herpes from some guy she'd hooked up with, and I told her to get checked and get drugs to make the irritation subside. All that was left was to Photoshop the images to make the date look like it was from months ago. Liv was a graphic designer, so she was able to do that. When it was perfect, I gave her one of my coworkers' numbers to send it to. 
Her name was Kylie. She was the department busybody, and I was sure that she was going to share the screenshots with everyone faster than the speed of sound. I also gave her Jake's number and she sent it to him too. The next day, as expected, the news had spread, and I met Alicia trying to prove that she wasn't the one in the chats. She couldn't prove it because she had disappearing messages on, which looked very suspicious. Eventually, she started to yell at me for spreading lies about her. She couldn't control her anger and got violent. I didn't fight back and they had to pull her off me, which was what I wanted. She was suspended from work for her misconduct, but she didn't return because of the humiliation of people thinking she had herpes. I never saw Jake again, but I'm sure he would have broken up with her eventually. It'll be difficult for him to stay with a girl when he thinks she has herpes. And with that, my revenge plan was complete. Honestly, if this is all OP had to do to kind of tear down her world and the relationship she had with the boyfriend she stole from OP, the whole thing sounded pretty flimsy to begin with, let's be real. Also, hi, I'm Steven, and if you guys enjoy crazy stories of revenge, it would be awesome if you left a like or left a review if you're listening to my podcast. That said, our next story is, Jerk Boss Steals My Code, So I Destroy His App. I, 24-year-old male, had been learning programming since my very first day in high school. I loved everything about it. I didn't know how to communicate with people or be anything less than awkward in a social setting, and because of this, I kept to myself a lot. It was just me in every programming language I could use. I programmed for over 5 hours daily, and by the time I was done with high school, I was good at it. I went on to college to do software engineering, and as you can imagine, I was ahead of all my course mates. They all looked at me like some kind of prodigy. They all came to me to help with assignments and projects, and by the end of the first year, I was ranked the best student in class. You'd think this was good for me, but no, it wasn't. In fact, this was the beginning of all my problems. During my sophomore year, I got an apartment and had a roommate, Colin, 26-year-old male. He was a fourth-year software engineering student. We became really close because he was two years ahead of me in class, and I fascinated him with my vast knowledge of all things programming. He had more experience than I did when it came to modern tools, and he was also well-connected on Twitter and Discord communities concerning software development, so we kind of complimented each other. I remember vividly when he came home one Thursday and told me to register for a Twitter competition. We were supposed to build an MVP, minimum viable product software, for a well-known tech company, and they were giving out prizes for the best build. I didn't want to do it at first because it was a lot of work, but it sounded exciting, so why not? It took me a little over three months to build the MVP, and when I submitted it days before the deadline, I won first place and received a huge cash prize. It felt good, but that was supposed to be the end of it. Two weeks later, some guy called me and said that he was from the company I developed the app for. The higher-ups were fascinated by my design, and they wanted me to come in for a meeting. I went there on a Monday, and after spending the first hour talking about my design, the boss came in, let's call him Adam. He complimented my design and offered me an internship. I was going to work directly under him and he was offering to give me front row seats to how a tech company really worked. It was a really good offer because I was looking to start my own company someday and so I said yes. I started my internship with Adam during the second semester of my sophomore year and I was the envy of my classmates. We were supposed to get internships in our fourth year. And there I was in my second year. I hadn't only secured an internship in my second year with one of the biggest tech companies at the time, but I also had a direct line to the CEO, Adam. It was a really nice ego boost for me because sometimes Adam would pop up in my school unannounced and pick me out from my friends saying they needed me in the company. As if my prodigy status wasn't enough, I ascended to the level of demigod by this time, at least in my head. Working with Adam was fun in the beginning. He was almost as much of a nerd as I was, and we could talk for hours on end about whatever build we were working on. Our relationship even transcended from boss and employee to friends, or at least so I thought. Adam would have me working at odd hours, which was out of the stipulated time of my internship contract but at the time I didn't mind. I loved the work I was doing. The only one who noticed that I was being used was Colin. One day, he woke me up by 3 a.m. to use the toilet, and he found me awake in the living room working on something. He asked me what I was doing, 
and I explained that Adam thought of some new idea that he wanted me to work on. That was the day Colin sat me down to tell me that I was being used. An internship was supposed to be an avenue for me to gain experience, not take on the job of three developers at once. I tried to laugh it off and told him that it was cool and that I was enjoying what I did for the company, but he wasn't having it. I wasn't getting paid for my work, so there was no need for me to stay up all night to write code, knowing fully well that I had to attend class in the morning. He told me to talk to Adam and set boundaries, and I agreed. The next day I called Adam and told him I'd like to stick to the agreed working hours in my contract, and he said he understood. He went on further to say that the only reason he called me after hours to work with me was because he felt closer to me than his other employees. I was stupid enough to fall for this trick, and I listened to him go on and on about how difficult it was to get good employees, and that he was so happy that I was working for him. I wasn't familiar with manipulation tactics, and so I didn't know what was going on. All I knew was that I told him to call me anytime he needed me to work, because I also considered him a friend too. The next time Colin saw me working late, I think this time it was around 6am and he was just coming back from some party. He met me at my computer and even though he was tired, he still sat down to talk to me about the insane hours I was putting into an unpaid internship. I told him that I talked to Adam and I gave him his feedback. I even defended Adam saying that we're friends and I loved working overtime with him. I had stayed up all night that morning, so when Colin tried to argue further, I got a bit cranky, and I may have said a few words which I totally regret now. After that day, Colin backed off, and I handled the Adam situation myself. During my third year first semester, my internship came to an end. I was ready to leave, but Adam wasn't looking to let me go. He said I needed more experience and extended my internship. I tried to object because I was hoping to have more time to myself to start developing an idea I'd been thinking about, but he wasn't having it. He even added a little monetary compensation and told me that he was hoping to employ me as soon as I finished college. It was a nice offer, but I wasn't even looking to work under a company when I was done with school. But no matter how much I argued and explained my point of view, Adam wouldn't just let me go. It was like one of those arguments where it looks like you're discussing, but deep down, you know you have no choice. I didn't want to turn it into a big deal, so I decided to stick around. Besides, if I wanted to work on my own startup, I could get Adam's guidance since he already owns a successful company. There shouldn't be any problems with that, right? Wrong. It took me almost six months to perfect the MVP of my first app. I can't talk a lot about the app because it's still not ready, but all I can say is that it has a unique way of running an e-hailing business. When I was building the MVP, I showed it to Adam and told him my plans for it. He was happy about my progress, or at least that's how it seemed, but as he looked through, he pointed out multiple errors. I really didn't think they were errors, but he insisted that there were better ways to build these components. When I asked him how, he told me not to worry and that he was going to help me work on it himself. I was so happy that one of the best minds I know found my work interesting enough to want to work on it. I didn't even think about it twice. I gave him the whole build. He told me that he was going to fix the errors and get back to me. But days turned to weeks and he didn't get back. Eventually, I called Colin and told him what was happening and he scolded me for giving away my code like that. I told him Adam was trustworthy and was already a multi-millionaire. Why would he need to steal from me? Eventually, I asked Adam himself what was going on with my program, and all he said was that he tried to make it work, but he just couldn't figure it out, and he didn't know how to tell me. I still didn't know what was going on because I still had the original program on my laptop, and I've run it over a hundred times and I couldn't find any problems with it. But soon enough, I found out the real reason why Adam wanted my program. A few weeks after the end of my second semester exams, he introduced a new e-hailing app. He said he had spent months working on it by himself, but it was now ready for testing. I was shocked that he built an e-hailing app, but I was even more horrified when I found out that he literally copied my code and used it in his app. I had access to the back end since I still worked in the company, and I was able to verify that it was my code. I confronted him about it, and he got furious at me for calling him out. Before I knew what was going on, he fired me from the company and promised to give me a poor review if any company interested in hiring me called him. I was shocked. I'd worked with him for a year by then, and that was how he was planning to pay me, by stealing my work and making my life miserable. 
I finally called Colin again and told him that he was right. I was a wreck. I'd have been thinking about launching that app since I got to college. I was just waiting for the right time. If Adam launched before me, I'd have lost everything. Because everyone would think I copied his code instead of the reverse. I won't be able to get funding. But Colin wasn't giving up. As long as Adam hadn't launched, we had a chance. He invited me over to his place so we could find a solution to the problem. He had graduated already so we no longer lived together. I got there and talked to him and a few friends of his. After a moment, one of his friends gave me an idea of sending him a virus. We were going to build one that would erase all the files in his office computer. I didn't even need to go to him because the computers in the office are all connected to one network. If one is infected, the others will be too. With this, we could wipe off my code from his computer and all the one for his app. But there was still one problem. Adam had a personal laptop and it's sure to contain a backup of my code and his app. But Colin had a solution for that too. All we had to do was send him an email with the virus on it. Once he opens it, the virus will do its job on the laptop. But we had to do it at the same time so he wouldn't know what hit him. We spent the entire day and night working on the virus, and once it was finally finished, we put it on a flash drive. I went to the company the next day under the guise of going to pack my things. I was able to distract one of my ex-co-workers and plug the flash drive into his computer. At that same time, I sent the email to Adam. I made sure to block my IP address and make sure there was nothing in the email that pointed to me so he wouldn't have any reason to track me down. My plan worked like a charm, and I watched all the employees run helter-skelter as their computers malfunctioned and erased themselves. Adam's computer was also erased after he opened the email, and just like that, his app disappeared forever. He had been blowing my phone up since then and sending me crazy texts, but it could never turn into a police issue because he could never prove that I erased his app. And just like that, my code was mine once again. Well, and also the fact OP didn't mention, but if they made this a legal issue, at that point the gloves are off, OP's going to have to get some kind of legal representation, and at that point they can present that they've written this code. Hopefully they have some kind of evidence that shows this is something they've been working on and writing well before Adam ever got his hands on it. And I imagine Adam doesn't want to make this a legal issue because he stands not only to get in trouble, but also could you imagine a CEO of a high-tech company getting outed as an in turn code stealing monster? Honestly, the headline probably wouldn't be that surprising to see. Our next story is, I flooded my ex bestie's apartment with water. I flooded my ex bestie's apartment with water. You will never guess why. Me and my best friend Andrea, not real name, had been friends for ages before we fell apart. Do you know how they say introverts are often adopted by their extrovert friends? That was what happened with my best friend. I was an introverted girl in high school and she was a stylish diva who hated all the popular kids and was just that popular girl who didn't have nor need a click. I was waiting around for my mom to come pick me up one afternoon. When she walked past me, she walked back and asked for my name and if I was okay. For a while, she'd randomly stop me to talk in the school hallway and sit quietly with me at the cafeteria. We soon started talking to each other, and after some months we became very close friends. My friend tried really hard to get me to become as outgoing as she was, but I wasn't interested in that life at the time. I didn't like wearing makeup, matching my purse to my sneakers or shoes, or wearing matching underwear. Even in college, I was always barefaced and my dress sense was just too bad. My social life wasn't great either. I didn't have friends or an active social life. It was just my best friend and anyone I met through her. All my friends were her friends. I didn't have separate friends of my own. My friend was the bubbly girl in high school and college. People liked and envied her fashion sense. She always looked good and knew just how to put outfits together, wore really good makeup that she always did well, and was good at organizing parties and just bringing people together. I was just trying to figure my life out. I hated what I was studying in college and it was too late to go back. I didn't want to put any kind of financial strain on my parents. I just wanted to be done with college and then find my passion. In my third year, my best friend and I moved in together to a small apartment just outside the university campus. It was the summer before that session that I started to think really long and hard about my life and what I wanted it to look like. I didn't like how I looked and wanted that to change. 
I started to look online for help. I checked fashion blogs to find out what kind of style I liked. I consumed a lot of fashion content and soon became good at dressing up. I got an idea of what would look good on me, ditched my eyeglasses for contact lenses, and started to wear makeup, albeit light ones. I looked good and I enjoyed how I looked. As I did all this, I noticed that I was starting to get attention from men. Even guys who previously hadn't noticed me started paying attention to me. Even girls started to pay attention to me too, especially the girls who visit my best friend and roommate often. In the past, they didn't really speak to me at all, but when I started to pay more attention to how I looked, they all started to say hello, linger around me more, and try to include me in their conversations. I noticed on different occasions that my best friend was uncomfortable with what was going on in my life, but I ignored the signs. I read a lot growing up, especially on psychology, so I understood that a little jealousy was okay. I justified it even. I thought that she was used to being the center of attention whenever we were together. It would take a while to get used to me being her beautiful, well put together friend. I then started to notice tiny acts of microaggression, like her making subtly nasty comments about my dress, shoes, and the color of my hair. I dyed my hair blonde, and trying to downplay whatever compliments someone else showered on me. If, for instance, someone compliments how the lipstick I was wearing was perfect for the shade of my skin, she would say, yeah well, but take a look at her shoes. Sometimes she overdid it so much that her friends would stare at her weirdly or even call her out on it. After getting pushback from her friends about her behavior, she stopped, but she still kept up with those nasty comments whenever we were alone together. I decided that I didn't just want to look good, I also wanted to feel good about myself. I was going to start exploring to see what I really liked. I've always been a great singer, but I hardly ever sing anywhere that was outside my bathroom. As a child, my mom said I had a great voice, and I even sang in the church children's choir, but I never thought I was good enough to make a career out of it. My parents were also big on formal education, so I just knew they wanted a traditional, white-collar career for me. I watched different YouTube videos on finding yourself and discovering what you love and are good at, so I decided to start singing again. A guy in one of my classes offered to teach me how to play the guitar, and he was going to do it for free, too. I accepted his offer and started to learn how to play the guitar. We hung out many times and he'd make me sing for him each time. That guy helped me become more confident as a singer. I started to sing in places that weren't just the bathroom. I sang in my bedroom and in the living room and just became very comfortable with being heard singing. Again, my friend didn't seem to like this. She never talked about my voice, the songs I sang or even acknowledged my singing. When any of her friends hear me sing and they praise me for it, she would not make any comment at all. I'd been ignoring her, but on one particular occasion, I confronted her. It happened that her friends and her boyfriend were visiting that day, and we all started to discuss the album of a famous artist that had just been released. We talked about our favorite song on the album, and everyone agreed that they liked one of the songs best. Everyone except me argued that they only didn't like one of the songs because they didn't really listen to the lyrics. I then sang the songs there. It wasn't planned, I mean, it wasn't like I set out to dazzle them with my voice, but I wanted them to understand that the song wasn't bad at all. They applauded me and started to compliment my voice. Despite their wows and didn't even know you could do that, my best friend said nothing. She just kept a straight face. That night I asked her why she did that, and then I told her that I'd noticed her behavior since I started to take myself seriously. She asked if I was saying that she was jealous, and I said yes. I did think she was jealous of all the attention I was getting. That upset her so much. She even cried and said that she was hurt that I'd accuse her of such. Then she picked a few of her things and left for her boyfriends. She was there for a while, but I started to feel guilty and went to her boyfriends to apologize and get her to return home. Shortly after she returned, I went for a singing audition that took place on school campus. The first stage of the audition was strenuous, but I scaled through. I was going to go for the second and then the third. The first three best singers would get popularity, a cash prize, and exposure. On the day I was supposed to go for the second audition, I woke up to my roommate on the couch groaning in pain. I was confused, naturally, since I'd never seen her in that state. I had to get her painkillers and a glass of water. She asked if I could get her orange juice from the fridge and I rushed to do so. When I'd returned, she'd taken the painkillers. I couldn't be at the second audition because I was busy looking after my friend. I didn't even think about my audition at all. 
I just wanted my best friend to be fine, and when I eventually did think about the audition, I just concluded that there would be other opportunities for me. Later that day, my best friend said that she was going to her boyfriend's. I tried to convince her not to go because it just didn't make sense to me that someone who was in so much pain some hours before could be well enough to want to spend the night at her man's. She insisted and left anyway. It was after she left that it occurred to me that my best friend could have faked the sudden tummy ache to prevent me from going for my audition. Still, I refused to believe that my friend would be that evil. I went to the couch she laid on when I found her in the morning dipped my fingers in the corner of the couch, and sure enough, I found the two tablets I'd given her in the morning there. I was so mad about what she'd done that I could barely speak for a week. I didn't speak to anyone. I refused to hang out with any of our friends too. They all just assumed I was going through something. It was already close to the end of the session, and the guy who offered to teach me to play the guitar and I were in a relationship. We'd agreed to live together in our senior year, and I was going to move out of the studio apartment I shared with my best friend anyway, but I wasn't just going to leave, I was going to get back at her for making me miss an important audition. After the session ended, she said she was going to spend a week with her parents and then move home, and then return to our apartment. When she left, I called her and told her that I found out she deliberately sabotaged me on the day of my audition. My friend tried to gaslight me again, but I shut it down. She just said, I guess I'm sorry. Then she hung up on me. You know what I did? That same week, I moved my things over to my boyfriend's, turned on all the taps in the house, shut all the windows, and left the house. I basically left the house flooded with water. It destroyed most of her stuff. She told some of our mutual friends that I was responsible for the flooding in her apartment, and I told them about what she did too. That was the end of our friendship. I'm curious to know what was the actual split of friends who were willing to align with the awful friend and who were willing to align with OP when given both sides of the story. Pretty easy way to figure out who truly could be your friend and who isn't. But with that being said, that's all the time we have for today. Now if you want to hear another absolutely crazy revenge story, check out that video on the left. Or if you missed my latest video, check out that video on the right. That said, I'll see you all next time with some more stories.